Welcome to In My Feelings, a safe space to talk all things NBA. I'm Big Waz. Let's go! All right, let's get right into factor feelings. And if you've been on the internet this past week, uh, this question has come up all over the place. Was Joel Embiid bullied into playing against the Golden State Warriors this past Tuesday night? Obviously, it's feelings. A professional basketball player cannot be bullied into something by observers. Again, this is not team people. It's not his coach. It's not management. It's not his teammates. These are outside people agitating to watch Joel Embiid hoop. People want to watch the guy hoop. Particularly, people want to see him play against the best, which is his counterpart, in Denver, Nikola Jokic. There's nothing wrong with fans wanting to see the best matchups and the same as media. That's not bullying. That's people having an admiration and appreciation for the talents that this guy brings. And so, yeah, people felt cheated that a big game comes up on the schedule. Everybody wants to see the rematch after Joel played so well against Nikola Jokic, the first matchup of the season. Yeah, people were clamoring to see it again. This is what sports is about. We want to see the best play the best. So no, this guy didn't get bullied. And no, because some people on the internet I saw were like, oh, see, you guys forced Joel to play and he got injured again. He played in a freak accident, the type of play that could happen in any NBA basketball game happened when Jonathan Kaminga fell on his leg. That is unfortunate, but it's the type of boom, boom, hustle, die for the loose ball kind of play that happens in every single NBA game. There's no reason to feel like Joel got bullied or coerced into playing, doing his job. It was an injury. And just as a quick aside, when the Warriors were playing the Raptors in the NBA Finals and Kevin Durant was suffering from a calf strain and there was like murmurs that he was kind of taking too long. Like this stuff was in the media, all of that stuff. And he came back immediately and snapped his Achilles in that same leg that he had the calf strain. Sure, it could have been argued that he might have came back too soon, right? It's obvious how you can make that one-to-one connection. A guy falling on Embiid's leg throughout the course of an NBA game. Come on, guys. Like, give it a rest. I get that it's a very long season, and we understand that guys have to pick their spots, but a marquee matchup against the best guy in the league, this is something everybody should want to see. And then the side issue of this new rule where you have to play a certain amount of games to be considered for postseason awards, I think that's a matter he should take up with his union, all of the players. As far as did this guy get bullied? No, he did not. Get out your feelings, folks. All right, next up, let's get into our vibe check. This time we're checking in on the Los Angeles Lakers. Let's face it, they're just not doing too good right now. They've been hovering around the 500 mark for weeks now. Just been a pretty pedestrian season considering they went to the conference championship last year. People foresaw pretty good things happening for them. And it just hasn't happened. And of course, this week we get our annual passive aggressive social media post from none other than LeBron James. LeBron James so upset. I don't want to even argue the idea that LeBron has things to be unhappy about. It's clear if you're 500 and you have championship level aspirations. This is unacceptable. But I wonder about the efficacy or how healthy taking this tact can even be where you're pressuring management via the media. We're hearing grumblings from people who have good Lakers sources that people aren't happy with the coaching. I wonder if agitating constantly for a change in the roster ultimately helps. We have to wonder if the role players on this team, knowing that they're on the hot seat, knowing that they're on the trade block from game to game, don't know if they're trusted, don't know if they're even going to be a Laker. I really do wonder if this is the tack that LeBron should be taking. I understand that in the past, particularly his second stint in Cleveland, 
where he didn't have a lot of trust and faith, and I think rightfully so, in ownership and Dan Gilbert and his group. He always felt like he needed to exert maximum pressure by signing these one-year deals at a time, by basically implying that at any time he could change his mind and leave. He felt like he needed to exert, you know, a high level of pressure on management, and that worked out, right? They eventually put together a championship squad they won in 2016, quite famously. It's sort of a lesson that LeBron is taking, but I don't know that it's working for all of the guys, like role players on a night-to-night -night basis who need as much confidence and security as possible. I understand what LeBron is doing. I get what he's dealt with in management in places like Miami, where he felt like they ruled with an iron fist and he had no say-so to Cleveland, where... He just didn't have trust or faith in management. And I think with the Lakers, it's kind of been this sort of softer, passive aggressive, hey, figure this thing out. He posted a hourglass emoji, which some people are interpreting to mean that time is up. Is time up on this roster or this iteration of it? Is time up on Darvin Ham as the coach of this team? Is time up on LeBron and his tender with the Lakers? Um, I wonder. But I, I just I just really do have to question the method to LeBron's madness here. All right, guys, I just want to take the time out today to just send uh, some words of encouragement to the fan base of my hometown, New York Knickerbockers. 20 years in the wilderness, pretty much ever since James Dolan was gifted this team from his daddy. It's been 20 years of misery, 20 years of incompetence, 20 years of brutality to arguably the most dedicated fan base, if not in the NBA, I would say all of American sports when you consider how futile the results have been and how dedicated they remain. Just undying support for this team. I want to send some words of encouragement to Knicks fans and encourage you guys to live in the now. This is the most positive of vibrations that have been around the Knicks in God knows how long. And I know a lot of people in my business, my industry, you know, all they want to talk about is who's the next superstar? What's the next transaction? What are they going to do in free agency? Who's going to come in? Who's going to blah, blah, blah? I get that temptation. However, you haven't had a team this fun this encouraging in so long. The brand of basketball that they play, hard nose, cohesive. These guys play for each other. You can tell that they like each other. This is so amazingly beautiful to see. And I just want to encourage Nick fans to live in the now. Enjoy this moment. Smell the roses, Nick fans. Because you never know when you're going to be back to Jerome James and Steve Francis and Clarence Weatherspoon and Eddie Curry. You never know when those dark days are going to be back. So please, man, just love on this team, man. Be happy for what you have right now because it's going to be an incredible ride. Talk about the journey you've been on and how it has reached this point now where you're on the garden floor hearing MVP chance and you're going to the All-Star game. I mean... I got nothing to say. I got nothing to say. All right, that was our show for today. Make sure you subscribe to The Ringer's YouTube feed. Make sure you hit the notification bell so that you're getting notified every single Friday when In My Feelings drop. We'll see you next week. Peace.